So Representative Massey, thank you so much for talking with me today about this pension bill. And obviously this is an issue that we've been talking about in Kentucky for a couple of years now. I mean, we've talked about the KRS system, which we did some changes to uh, back in 2013. And the teacher's retirement system has remained unchanged uh, outside of small changes for a while. And obviously we've had lots of bills up until this point, but you are gonna sponsor our bill in 2021. So what is that bill gonna look like? Well, uh, the bill, first of all, I need to talk about how we got there because there were some very big uh, scars that are still remaining from what happened a couple of years ago. And so I was committed when I came to the legislature, the first committee that I asked to serve on was education. And the reason for that is my background in education, my parents are educators, all three of my daughters are in education. Um, and I served on the Boone County School Board for 22 years as president of KSBA, president of NSBA. And so I consider myself very friendly, very pro public education. So I was asked um, earlier this year uh, by one of the members of the house if I would consider working on this because they felt like I had a good relationship with members of the education community. So I said that I would. Now this is not a sanctioned work group. It is not a task force. So what I did is I put together a large group that discussed where we could go to make some corrections we would believe that would have some substance. So the group is consistent of myself, uh, Representative James Allen Tipton, Representative Jerry Miller, um, Representative Steve Riley, Senator Jimmy Higdon, and Senator Max Wise, in addition to Eric Kennedy from KSBA, um, Wayne Young and Rhonda Caldwell from KASA, Jim Flynn from KASS, Mary Rubel from KEA, Eddie Campbell from KEA, Brent McKim from JCTA, Tim Abrams from KT, well, it's the Kentucky T Retired Teachers Group. Um, we also had Commissioner Glass, Aaron Thompson from secondary schools, and um, then we've had some people that have also expressed some interest. So about six months ago, I made a commitment to them last session that before anything got filed, it would not be filed at the 11th hour, and then we would start working through it then because in a session, it's too busy, people feel attacked, they feel put on the defensive, and that was never my intent. My intent was to work around that situation and have all of the stakeholders at the table. Um, Certainly leadership gave me the authority to do that, but again, it wasn't a sanctioned work group. It wasn't a task force. This is something as an education person I wanted to do. And I got buy-in or communication from all of those groups. It's been a very civil process and we've discussed all of the data, which goes back to what the bills that were filed before and where we go now. So we just started out with an open table and that's how we came. This is how this legislation that we're going to file came to be. And that's an impressive group because that's always been the hang up, especially in years past that education groups have not been on board. The KEA in particular, so to hear KEA's name uh, is very interesting and encouraging because again, this issue has been contentious in the past. There's been multiple bills, multiple failed attempts and overturned by the Supreme Court. This is a tough issue um, because you're talking about people's retirement. So, but from what I understand, your proposal is for new hires only. And I want to talk about the details of the bill. But basically, you're saying that those, all of those groups and individuals that you listed are supportive of the bill or just have been part of the process? Well, they've been part of the process. I feel a general sense of support. Okay. Some groups have come out and said, we support it. Um, I'm not, at this point, going to put them um, in the firing line, so to speak. Uh, there are some that said, hey, we can live with it. Um, it's not something that I expect everybody to do cheers for, because anytime that there's a change, uh, people get nervous. And I, one of my favorite sayings from a leadership book from years ago in education was called Leadership on the Line. And it says, people don't fear change, they fear loss. And that's loss of control, loss of power, loss of prestige, in this case, loss of benefits. Um, and so I felt like we just need to have this very open and candid conversation to do that and that it has worked very well. And we've had participation. When I say they were at the table, we've had active participation from all groups. And let's talk real quick for people who don't know about why we need 
pension changes in the first place. Obviously, like I said, Kentucky retirement system, the one we've already made changes to is woefully underfunded. I mean, in the team in terms of their uh, funded, the Kentucky teachers retirement system is at a higher ratio, uh, a lot higher, but our general fund dollars are directly tied much more to the teachers retirement fund. So a couple years ago, the fund itself said we're kind of at a tipping point Obviously, uh, pension systems are like this because people are living longer and a lot of different things. So that's kind of why this has been a discussion for so long. But over the last couple of years, the teachers and the K groups have kind of been like, we don't need changes to the system, leave it alone, continue to fund it. But a lot of people argue that that's not reasonable and that's not the long-term solution in terms of making sure it's secure for the future. A lot of the bills have either talked about moving to a hybrid system, and I think in more recent years, it's been more uh, kind of make some smaller tweaks and have some safeguards in terms of once the funding level gets down. But again, you're now putting money into two pots. But I want to hear from you about your proposal and what that looks like for new hires, what kind of system they would be put into, what the retirement age looks like, basically what's different from what they're getting now. Well, the first thing about this, this is a is going to be a hybrid type plan. So it's something that will take some of the responsibilities away from the um, from some of the responsibilities away from the state and transfer it. Uh, I'm going to start with a little story. When I was president of NSBA, we had to move from a defined benefit plan to an entirely defined contribution plan. Had we not do, done that at NSBA, the association would have been bankrupt. Now that's a private group and I understand that, but there's some analogies to be drawn here. The problem with our current system is it's simply not sustainable with the current dollars that we're receiving. And while we're trying to find additional ways to generate revenue, um, I wanna remind all people that are, are watching that you know legislators are not just in the business of education. We're in the business of education, transportation, infrastructure. You know, We didn't know we were gonna be hit by a global pandemic. And so there are financial issues at stake here and there's just not enough money to go around. And unlike the federal government, we can't print money or incur that kind of debt. We have to balance our budget. So this legacy deficit that has accrued is something that has got to be dealt with at some point. And so we looked at what small step could we take to kind of stop the bleeding uh, that this debt didn't continue to accrue and grow further out of control. And for some of the same reasons you said, people are living longer. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, the average retirement age I learned in the past couple of weeks for teachers is 59. Um, so we took all of those things into consideration and thought, what can we do now? And I use the words to stop the bleeding so that we still are gonna have to go back at some point somehow and deal with this legacy deficit. There's just not an appetite to do that right now, especially in the midst of a global pandemic um, we understand also that there are parts of the inviable contract, and that was very much explained to us uh, by the persons from TRS about what's in the inviable contract, what is not in the inviable contract. And so we discussed all of those things, and that's what led us to this point that there is, if we can do something, this is where we would start. So, and also, I know that I have to get this through the Senate if we get it through the House. And pretty much the concert from the senators that I've talked to is we want a new hire plan only. Um, and I understand that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, my dad always taught me to eat an elephant one bite at a time. And uh, this is just a bite. This is not going to solve everything. And certainly this is not meant to, to in any way harm teachers. There's nobody that's more friendly or more passionate about teachers than I am. Um, I'm trying to look for this note that I'm finding. So we looked at some uh, things, for instance, we looked at a change, if there was any change to existing members. There was no consensus whatsoever to include these items in a proposal at this time. There just wasn't. Um, and I get that. I mean, my mom's a teacher. She lives on teacher's retirement. My dad's a teacher. I certainly don't want to do anything to affect my father or my mother or my children. And, and also, I want to keep the promise that the state of Kentucky has made to these teachers. But the issue is, how do we stop this problem from even becoming worse? Um, also, funding plan. Um, there is really no way to discuss how are we going to get money to solve all this deficit that we have. Uh, that's still going to have to be dealt with and fleshed out over time. And again, there was no consensus of the group to deal with that issue at this time. So we came up with a common solution 
that would be very interesting uh, because it actually has some protections built right into it. So the first thing to get to the tenets of the bill is that this bill would be for new hires only. It would kick in in January of 2022. Um, the great thing about that is there's a stabilization fund that would be created, which means we're creating a new tier. And if at any time this fund, which would be 100% funded when it started, if at any time it fell below 90%, there are triggers and mechanisms and actions that the TRS board would have to take to stabilize the fund. So we learned from past mistakes and we've created a model that would have a mechanism that recorrects that. So that fund for those new hires would always be fully funded. The reason that's so important is, is I think about recruitment of good teachers and we all know that a good quality teacher in the classroom has the most dramatic impact on public education. Um, and because of that, um, we want to be able to recruit, recruit and retain the highest functioning and the highest performing teachers. Well, right now with the um, instability of what's going on and what's in the air, I think teachers that are coming out into the field are like, well, do I really wanna work in Kentucky or should I put my eggs in a different state? Um, and so that's a real concern for us. And, and I want to make sure we keep good teachers here. So at the very least, they need to know what they're getting once we put this into place. This would only be again for new hires. Now with life expectancy increasing, um, we also know that people are working longer. And so people would still be able to retire at age 55, but obviously the care it would be that if you stay longer, that there are more benefits as you go through. And that's the carrot, if you will, to try to get people to work longer. And again, the average retirement age for teachers right now is 59. So we're within that gap from uh, the 55 to 60. Um, we also believe from the healthcare portion that the way this is, is working with healthcare is that we're moving towards a model that would be fully funded in a few years. And so there might be some monies generated through this process that could be used to solve some issues elsewhere. And so we're still working on some tweaks to that. To, uh, one of the concerns of the people that have raised this is if you retire at 55 and your health benefits don't kick in until you're at age 60, how's somebody that was on a teaching salary gonna pay for those benefits, which would be available to them, but they would have to pay basically the premium of that cost. Um, of course, that's the carrot to try to keep them working a little bit longer, but we're trying to also get a situation where at least a portion of that would be funded over time so they could make that work if they wanted to. I think my dad retired when he was 53 or 54. Um, you know, part of the thing that we get from the other side of the aisle, not, when I say the other side of the aisle, I don't mean the, the Democratic Party yet or anything like that. The other side of, of the other people in the workforce is a lot of people don't even think about besides police and firefighters who are in a special hazardous duty format and arguably teachers could be there too. And I taught school for a while, so I get that. Um, but arguably they're 20 and out. But really all other occupations for the most part are working longer um, to sustain and to, to pay. And of course the teacher's dilemma is that they don't have social security. Uh, and that's something that's been, um, you know, had to be made known to a lot of people. A lot of people, a lot of legislators, I don't think when they first come to office realized that teachers don't pay into social security. The only way they've paid in is you have a teacher that worked partial career first, paid into social security and then started collecting the teacher's benefits. So that's kind of, that's kind of uh, in a general uh, where we are. Now what the proposal is to date, it would be a, it would be a blended model, a hybrid uh, known as the foundation benefit and supplemental defined contribution type of benefit uh, known as the supplement benefit, okay? Uh, a minimum retirement age of 55 with incentives to work longer and retire later. And so that's what I was just talking about a minute ago. Uh, fixed contribution rates for employee and the state. 10% uh, total for the state with 8% to the foundational and 2% to the supplemental. Again, building a stabilization review re, uh, fund for purposes of correcting any time that there wasn't proper funding. Uh, that's the risk controls that's talked about in the next bullet point that I have. Um, and we wanna use a stabilization reserve account. That would be that if there's a, 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 for some reason it falls below, there would be mandatory statutorily required steps to trigger uh, use of that stabilization review fund to fully fund that particular mark. Um, it would adjust the benefit components for new hires, including retirement age, benefit factors, COLA, interest credit to a member's account, et cetera. 
And it's also created for the university members as well. Now that is one group that has absolutely said we are 100% behind it, but they're a little bit different format than the public education groups. Um, I've talked at great lengths with Eric Kennedy. I've talked at great lengths with uh, Jim Flynn. I reached out to Eddie Campbell a couple of nights ago and we actually gave permission uh, maybe a month ago or so for him to send this out to all of the membership for the KEA. Um, I did a presentation earlier in the week or last week with KASA that had about 70 or 80 superintendents on the call. So we have really massaged and worked this. Now, one of the things that they wanted in the bill, and I'll tell you why it's not in the bill right now, is a, they wanted a provision in there that would pr protect the TRS board from being changed. And you might remember that there was a bill filed, um, I think it was year before last, about not changing the TRS or about changing the TRS board. And so they wanted that in there, but here's what I think is gonna happen. I think there's gonna be, and I've actually agreed to sponsor another bill that would prohibit the governor from changing the, the TRS board, the KERS board or the CERS board so that they would have that consistency over time. And actually the TRS board has performed quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one piece that they asked for. The other one is the requirement that we fully fund the ARC every year to pay for this uh, deficit liability that exists. Well, again, because this is a new hire bill only, and we're not trying to deal with the legacy deficit in that, in that other plan. This is a new tier. So we wanna keep that purified. I do believe that the legislature will fully fund the ARC. I think there's a consensus and a commitment to do that. But this is to basically help teachers that are out there in the in their graduating. I got a daughter that graduates in December that's looking for an elementary education job. And she wants to know what her prospective benefits will be when she does finally reach retirement age. And um, you know, and I and I get that. I really do. And so we're trying to protect teachers. And, and I think sometimes the soreness that was created last time, people immediately think that if there's a bill being filed about pensions that it's somehow being directed to do harm. I don't wanna do harm to anyone. I wanna help a problem that exists, which is why I believed it was imperative to have all of these stakeholders at the table to come to some kind of consensus together. Will everybody like it fully? No. Uh, I've been a lawyer for 29 years and we always tell people in mediation that usually a successful mediation was when both parties leave not very happy, but they can live with the result that they came to. Um, I think we're in the same boat here. I mean, if we were flush with money and that wasn't an issue, I'm all for fully funding the, the, the old plan, the new plan, I'm for giving teachers more money. Um, I think teaching is, is a profession that needs to be cherished as a true profession. You know, I spoke all over the world about education. I've been to Finland where teachers are revered much like any other professional in the community. And I believe they serve that purpose. So my first thing as an educator is I want to do no harm to them, but I have to be realistic too, that the world has changed around us. And I often quoted when I was NSBA president, a comment by John F. Kennedy that said, change is the law of life. And those who look to the past are certain to miss the future. Um, we just have to be adaptive. We're not trying to uh, play any gotcha games. And, and I, that's why I was committed. I would not be part of a bill that was filed secretively or at the 11th hour and I even told Eddie Campbell two days ago when somebody said something about a, a bigger change, I said, look, I'm not comfortable with making any bigger change right now because I don't want anyone to feel like there's been any shenanigans or anybody being hoodooed. I said, first of all, when I file the bill, um, you know, it could, it's gonna be subject to committee, possibly committee subs, floor amendments, and then it's gotta go to the Senate. So what I file may not be exactly what we end up with anyway. So I'm starting with what can we live with? And to your point, a couple of points. So first of all, for people who are watching this who don't fully understand, especially as you talk about the legacy deficit, Kentucky is deep, deep in pension debt. I mean, it's a lot. But here's the thing that a lot of people don't understand too. We, this is one of the only things in state government that we literally have to pay for. It's one of the only things that is obligated. And like you said, the inviolable contract, we can't not pay these bills. Even if Kentucky were run out of money. We're a taxing authority. We have to come up with the money and the bill has to be paid. And that's why we have to worry about what's happened now and the future, which is why a new bill and a new system is what you are looking at. 
That's but correct. Again, uh, as people talk about these issues, it is it it's it's a touchy subject, and I'm glad to hear that you've been involving the K groups because again, people are scared of losing benefits or anything else. Um, but because of that, there's it's had a hard time passing in the past. We've seen similar bills. Um, and obviously you've brought people to the table. There's been a longer discussion. It's not going to be at the final hour. So these are all positive things. But in 2021, you guys have a short session. You have to craft a budget. We're in the middle of a pandemic. The redistricting is supposed to be done in 2021. Is the appetite there? Uh, especially as you said, like it has to go through the House and the Senate and then the governor. And do you think the governor would be willing to sign this type of law if you guys pass it? Well, I think that th that's why I've included the representatives and the senators I have in the group discussion. So um, knowing that that's going to be communicated back to their membership, uh, and I'm sure to the governor's office as well, um, that that's part of the process. So I think there is an appetite to do something. And I think that's the case because people are just tired of dealing with this. They're tired of reading and looking at bills every session, and they want to get on to some other things that they're involved in or interested in. Um, again, um, it, it's, you know, the, one of the questions I get, is it too soon, given the explosive situation that happened a couple of years ago? Uh, again, that's why I went about it the way that I did. Um, I'm certainly not trying to raise the ire of anyone. Um, I welcome the input. In fact, we have another meeting that is scheduled for the 10th at 2.30. And, um, and I'm sure that they'll make, they might make some, I will only agree to some minor tweaks at this point, because again, I want people to know what they're dealing with. And then the plan is to file it on Friday as a pre-filed bill. People can absorb it, read it, complain about it, praise it, whatever they want to do. And then when it gets to committee, you know, I might even be persuaded in the interim, if it comes up with someone with a really good solution, that we have a committee set. You know, so that's where these bills, you have to start somewhere. And, um, and that's kind of where we are. And I want the people that would be affected the most to have the say so on this particular piece of legislation. Um, I think the, the governor and I, um, we don't, we haven't communicated um, in all candor um, about this, um, but the governor does know from past uh, times with uh, being around uh, education groups with me at KSBA, et cetera, of my passion for education. He also knows that I have a genuine interest in protecting and helping teachers. Um, I think he does too in that respect. Um, I don't want this to become a political battle. I don't wanna draw political lines. All I see is there is a problem and we need to find a solution. And this is the step towards that solution. Anything else we haven't covered uh, that you want? Well, I, I'm looking forward to see, you know, I hope that I, one of my things as a legislator, as a lawyer, as a person, is I hope people will remain civil. Um, I hope people don't just get, see pension bill or see something of that nature and then just immediately erupt, um, you know, or say things on social media. That doesn't really do any good for anybody. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm basically, you know, I, in the same book, it talks about a lot of people, uh, a lot of times people don't dislike you, they dislike the message you're carrying. Well, I'm not trying to carry a bad message. I'm trying to carry a hard message, just like a parent. Sometimes we have to tell our children, uh, you know, that, that this is from our experience, that this is what's best or not best. Now, am I saying that I have that kind of power? No, I'm not. Sometimes I have to be told. And sometimes I learn from my children. They tell me what's correct because I'm so embedded in my old way of thinking that I've not welcomed a new way of thinking. And so I think we all have to come to the table together and appreciate and respect one another and that we have a civil, prosperous discussion about positive differences we can make. Again, I will be the first to tell you that I believe the ed education is a civil right. I believe that. I believe that education is the key to building Kentucky's economy. Um, I believe that we need to find ways to keep our students that are educated here in Kentucky. And so I think the education is fundamental. And so, you know, in recent, and I think people that know me, and it may be something that's even an affront to some of the, the chamber folks, is I've always been against scholarship tax credits because I'm not for taking money away from schools and for private schools when I believe that we have to fix the problem with our public schools first. Um, and, and it's not a matter of private schools of not caring for them. I do care for them. And if people can afford private schools, that's awesome. Um, but at the same time, I'm charged by the Constitution and by court decisions 
to provide a free and appropriate public education for every child in the Commonwealth. We can only do that if we have good quality teachers in the classroom. So I want this bill to, to be able to uh, be prosperous, but not go too far, if, if that makes sense. And, um, and again, it's one step, it's a ladder. We didn't get this way overnight. It's not gonna go away overnight. And so I'm trying to solve, solve a very complicated, um, very controversial problem, one step at a time.